Look into my eyes. Do you see fear? You come at me with sword and spear, but I come in the name of the God of Israel. <laughs> yes! <laughs> right between the eyes! Did you see that? Anyone? Uh, of course not. Okay, then. One more time. <laughs> tally, tally, no, <not laughs> no. I'm trying to protect us from this Philistine. Oh. Whoa, 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 No, not that way. Come on. Back to your mom. Right, Philistine. Oh, wait. Right between the eyes. Oh, of course. That one you saw. Tally! <laughs> No! I'm coming, girl! Whoa, whoa, it, easy! Shira, Shira! I will bring her home safely. I'm almost in love! Bible movie that was as powerful as the Prince of Egypt and as fun as Tangled. That's about as likely to happen as David beating Goliath. Oh, 
See what I did there? Well, it's happening. We are making an epic David and Goliath animated film. David will be an animated feature film that shows the power of the David story with the humor, music, and adventure of your favorite animated movie. And by expressing your interest in investing, you can help bring David to life with the production quality of a classic animated film while revealing God through one of the Bible's most powerful stories. Did you see that? Anyone. A group of filmmakers in South Africa called Sunrise Animation Studios has been carefully assembling the right team to make David. This David project has already generated $19 million in investments and inspired some of the world's leading animation film professionals to leave major Hollywood studios and be a part of this story. The Sunrise team includes senior contributors to movies like Moana, Monsters, Inc., Soul, and Big Hero 6 as well as Grammy award-winning composers. Basically, David is the answer to the question, what if the best Bible stories were told by the world's best animators and musicians? Click the link to express your interest today. David tells the story of a young shepherd who gains fame as a musician and a warrior for the king. I'm trying to protect us from this Philistine. He shows the viewer what it truly means to be a man after God's own heart. David is the original underdog that has gone on to inspire the greatest underdog stories of all time. Don't believe me? Just re-watch Harry Potter and Star Wars. Instead of using magic or the force to defeat giant villains, David uses the power of God to overcome a literal Goliath. And he reminds each of us that we're the underdog of our own stories. And through God, all things are possible. David's story has never been told on a cinematic level. And to accomplish that, you need a combination of a good budget and good storytellers. The faith community has the right storytellers, but most independent Bible films look like independent Bible films. But with your investments, combined with the storytelling prowess of Sunrise Animation Studios, we are finally telling David's story in a way that belongs on the silver screen. And did I mention, it's a musical. Ben, God, it's a so beautiful. The creation of David the movie is a Goliath-sized story. Sunrise knew that in order for a small film studio to make an epic movie on par with the big boys, they'd have to nail it between the eyes. Pun intended. And after all these years, they've assembled the right team to go the distance. All that's missing is you. Click the link to watch a small teaser we made for David. David will be distributed by Angel Studios, the same film studio behind the smash hit success, The Chosen, a TV show about Jesus that has over 300 million views and has generated over $100 million in revenue. Sunrise Animation Studios created Jungle Beat, an animated brand that has a feature movie on Netflix with a sequel in production and gets 140 million monthly views on YouTube. Mm -hmm. If they can do that with a monkey and an elephant, imagine what they can do with one of the most iconic figures of all time. When you express interest in investing in the animated film, David, you're not just helping to create an epic animated adventure based on one of the most popular books of all time. You're creating a movie in one of the most successful categories of film. The Prince of Egypt made 218 million in revenue at the box office, plus two decades of DVD, TV, and streaming sales. And like The Prince of Egypt, David also has powerful songs and breathtaking animation. Plus one thing The Prince of Egypt doesn't have, this baby land. You do the math. And aside from the potential financial return, bringing such an important story to life can be incredibly rewarding. Hi there, my name is Phil Cunningham, and I was inspired by this character and thought if we could tell an animated feature film around the life of David, it would inspire people to take on the giants in their life and to live bigger, braver, bolder lives. David has the chance to be the next big movie that every kid, parent, and Pixar fan will fall in love with. Click the link to express interest in investing today. Good evening, everyone. This is so exciting to be back with another live stream. I am Rita Mbunga, one of the producers of David the Movie, and I'm gonna be your host this evening. So we'd love to just welcome all the David fans and everyone tuning in to watch this live stream. I'm gonna just tease the lineup quickly and then dive right in. We've got such an incredible guest tonight, and I feel really privileged to be able to interview him. Um, he is a world-renowned expert in musicology and ethnomusicology. 
Um, as you guys know, a lot of you know, we're gauging interest to crowdfund the rest of our production budget for our movie on David. So please go to angel.com forward slash David to express interest. We just appreciate all the support we've got so far and would love um, yeah, comments if you have any questions, like, share and comment on our posts. It is so, so, so welcome. We read everything and we just really feel uh, so much love. So we just want to say thank you so much. And um, we're looking forward to continuing walking this journey with all of you. And so I'm so delighted to have Professor Mark Kliegman on with me tonight. Professor Kliegman is the inaugural holder of the Mickey Katz Endowed Chair in Jewish Music at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music, where he is a professor of ethnomusicology and musicology. He specializes in the liturgical traditions of Middle Eastern Jewish communities and various areas of popular Jewish music. He has published on the liturgical music of Syrian Jews in Brooklyn in journals as well as in his book, Makram and Liturgy, Ritual Music and Aesthetics of Syrian Jews in Brooklyn, published by Wayne State University in 2009. This book shows the interconnection between the music of Syrian Jews and their cultural way of life. His other publications focus on the intersection of contemporary Jewish life and various liturgical and paraliturgical musical contexts. Orthodox popular music is the subject of his current work. Professor Kliegman is the academic chair of the Jewish Music Forum, the co-editor of the journal Musica Judaica, and the chair of Jewish Studies and Music Group of the American Musicology Society. He's also on the board of the American Society for Jewish Music. Professor Kliegman is the director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience at UCLA. So as you can see, we have a super expert, so highly accomplished in, and experienced in Jewish music and its history. And we are so excited to have found you, Professor Kliegman, and to be working with you on the authenticity of the music in our film, David. So without further ado, I would love to invite Professor Kliegman onto the screen. Welcome. Hello. Great to be here. Thank you, Rita. Yeah, you, your, your bio is just so, so impressive. I'm just in awe of you. And so it's really my honor to be speaking to you. Thank you. Excited to be here and this project is so exciting. Thank you so much. The, the first question I have for you is, you're a professor of both ethno ethnomusicology and musicology. Please, could you explain the difference between the two? Sure. Musicology is generally understood as being the history of music, largely Western music. And it's a field that's been around for a few hundred years, very developed among uh, German scholars in the 19th into the 20th century. And of course, it's now uh, a worldwide uh, a field of study. And the study of, of, of other cultures of, with music around the world is really what ethnomusicology started out to be. So the field really established itself in the 1950s. So it's a much younger field as an academic discipline. But a key difference is, is that ethnomusicology searches to find out how music is related to culture. Is it music in culture, music as culture? However, music and culture connect, bringing in a lot of anthropological uh, approaches, ethnomusicology is focused there. So in some ways there is some overlap. Um, I was trained uh, to do both, and I'm very excited that uh, my current work position, I'm able to do both. That's, that's amazing, and that's so insightful. Thank you. Um, well, so what made you so interested in the history of music? Like, why did you train in both? You know, yeah, what about it made you so... Yeah, well, a lot of it has to do with Jewish music. Um, when I was studying as a, an undergrad, and I learned a lot about the history of Western music, and it's a focus on um, music of the church and Christianity, I just really felt there had to be a connection to Judaism since Judaism predates Christianity. And so I got very interested in the antiquity of the fields. And then I was in graduate school, I really realized that, you know, history is not always the only tool to use to understand a phenomenon. You have to look at things that are happening today and in the present. And that's where I uh, gravitated towards ethnomusicology to really learn how to do what we call ethnographic studies or studies of the present, looking at things that are today. And I really hope that in my work that I do, that I balance both perspectives. That's amazing. So, so are you a musician yourself? 
I am. I started off playing clarinet and I play various wind instruments uh, for a school. Uh, for my undergraduate degree, I had to reach a certain level of piano. So piano is my most accomplished instrument. And uh, the thing I do most actively today is I'm a conductor of uh, a community oh, synagogue choir. And then we have ensemble performances of instrumentalists. So I, I really love engaging in, in conducting. That's so amazing. I'm, I'm always in awe of conductors. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, do you have a favorite instrument? Well, I think that um, it, it, it's hard to say, but I, I would, would lean towards um, the oboe. I played uh, oboe in high school and actually entered into music school playing oboe before I switched to music theory. And uh, I think oboe is such a fascinating instrument because it's um, it may be not used as much as other instruments in the orchestra, but it has such an interesting, uh, unique sound that really has a lot of depth. Mm, it, it is. It's it's amazing. I do love an oboe. It, it's uh, yeah. It's it's wonderful. That's awesome. So just jumping back to specifically the music in the time of David. What what do you know for sure about music in that time? What we know for sure through the temple is that music was a part of, of, of life at the temple, not just among Jews, but just amongst people of the world. And that mm -hmm. various forms of singing, various uses of instruments were just a part of life. And they were a part of uh, the joy of life, of expressions. And they were also a part of, of death. We don't normally have... Um, you know, maybe clear ideas now of the way that music may work in uh, funerals. But in terms of the way that the Bible describes it, there might be flute players, there might be drums. There are various ways in which music was also uh, a part of death and uh, in other other parts of life. So we know that music was, was uh, hugely celebratory and used for religious purposes and also for uh, non-religious purposes as well. That's incredible. Um, and what do you think is the most fascinating aspect of the music around the time of David? I think that um, a good uh, example of that would be how individuals really could play a really key role in, in, in music. And David, of course, is a, is a great example of that. But uh, how people could uh, play instruments and really uh, have an impact on people's lives. Uh, mm. That music uh, can play uh, multiple roles, I think is a very significant aspect. I, I, yeah, that is incredible. And I guess that's where the ethnomusicology as well, part, part of that comes in, right? Like how different cultures, it's, it's different, right? Um, oh, so absolutely. Really interesting. Yeah. Absolutely, and one yeah. of the things that we know when we look at things historically and over time that the various instruments that uh, were used come in many, many different forms. And it's, mm -hmm. it's basically there's no one version, there are just many different versions. Yeah, I love that. Um, one of the things the Bible is super clear about is David being brought into Saul's service as a musician. Can you talk more about this and what it would have looked like at the time to actually be a musician in service of the king? Sure. So um, probably most people know the story in uh, the book of Samuel of how uh, so, uh, Saul has um, what we would probably call depression today. And he says to his courtiers, bring me a musician. So they say, let's go to uh, the, the, the son of Jesse, it's known. He's a well-known musician. So uh, the son of Jesse is David. So David uh, is considered to be a very uh, important musician. But what's very interesting about uh, that uh, um, statement in the Bible is that it says that David is uh, prudent in speech, that he's good looking, that he's good in war, and he's a musician. So it's interesting that there are many, many different traits, and that being a musician mm -hmm. is really, uh, uh, sort of like, like the clinch all uh, aspect of it. And uh, as the story goes on, uh, Saul has uh, like this wave of depression. David comes and plays for him, which alleviates that, 
that depression. So it's an amazing story about the power yeah. and significance of music. Of music, it really is incredible. Um, and just as a matter of interest for me personally, what was the role of women in music in David's era? Like, is there an instrument that David's mother might have played? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. We really don't have a lot of clarity on that. And we do yeah. know that uh, women played drums and many uh, centuries before that, in the book of Exodus, when it refers to the song of the sea, um, after Moses leads um, uh, the children of Israel, the people of Israel in a song, it says after that, that Miriam played the drums and danced with the women. So that's really pretty good indication that, you know, drums are a very important aspect in the lives mm -hmm. uh, of women. So it's, um, I, if you were to say what instrument could David's mother play, maybe it was the drum. That's awesome. I love that. Love that. Amazing. So Mark, I know you've prepared an awesome presentation. So I'd love to throw up a few slides on the screen. And if you would be happy to kind of talk us through what we're uh, seeing on the screen, and then I'll have a few questions on each as we as sure. we go, if that's all right. You Amazing. Bet. So let me so just... So the errors of antiquity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah let me you. just begin that um, the top portion that provided are um, the significant eras that archeologists use in terms of the Stone Age, the Bronze Age and so forth. And the um, timeline on the bottom, um, roughly speaking, it's probably not measured out to be an exact distance between years, but um, uh, are, is Jewish history, the era of the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, uh, the story of the book of Exodus, uh, the rule of King David, and we can see the rule of King David is uh, a, an important time period between the Bronze and the Iron Age. And the numbers between the two boxes represent the number of archeological finds that uh, uh, relate to musical instruments. And I know what we'll refer to some of those shortly. That's awesome. And then um, this page, the string instruments, please talk about all of these and what we're seeing. And, and also I'd love to know if they have a modern day equivalent sound perhaps. Sure, so the two most significant uh, string instruments in the Jewish tradition are uh, the kinor, which we see on the left, and the nevel, which we see on the right. So the kinor on the left would be more or less a handheld lyre, and that would be something that we would, that one would hold and and play and presumably sing along. And the nevel would be a much larger instrument, which would rest on the floor and have a, a deeper, more resonant uh, sound. Um, the kinor uh, is the instrument associated with King David. That's the instrument that he uh, is known to have played. And although the kinor is not, um, uh, a, a typical instrument of, of lyres of people playing today, the nevel is probably equivalent to the um, to the modern day harp. What's interesting is that in modern day Hebrew, the word kinor refers to a violin, and oh, although wow. the word, instead of violin it, it dates to David's era, it's it's sort of just the you know the use of that term which i think is really quite beautiful is to use this biblical term to refer to a very significant instrument instrument exactly i love that that's so funny because i guess i always thought that the lyre was what was associated yes this image of the lyre player i always kind of thought that that was what david would have played but you're saying a kinor and a lyre are similar right a kinor the lyre would just be um a one translation of the kinor so um, the key, sometimes the kinor in certain texts is translated as a harp, which really would not be the right translation. Harp is a better mm. translation of nevel, but the kinor and lyre okay. would really be the same. Okay, amazing. And then this, there's, a, there's another image, um, the lyre player on a clay pot with animals. Um, I, I love this. Can you talk to us a bit about this? Yeah, sure. Can we go to the previous one? I, I, I just wanted to mention something about that. Is that okay? So in this one, which really is a very old um, 
uh, a fine from Mesopotamia is um, a seal. And they would make these seals so that you could put um, uh, wax. I remember as a kid, we used to do this where you put wax on an envelope and then you heat up the seal and then it would, would sort of emboss. And that's what this is. And this seal is like the diameter of a pencil. It's very, very small. So this picture that we blew up is sort of bigger than, than it would be in, in sort of in real life. But what's significant here is we can sort of put ourselves in the time period of, uh, of this era and of King David, where someone would, would play the lyre. And um, it's hard to know with these very, very small figures, the proportionality, but presumably someone is playing the lyre in front of you know, a, a, a person of significance, of aristocracy, mm -hmm. or, or in our case of the story of Saul, someone who is a king. And uh, it really kind of shows what the environment would be. And of course, we're not in an era of, you know, um, uh, of iPods or, and music and Bluetooth speakers, you know, that music is really made. And this, this really puts us in that, in that era. That's fascinating. I can't believe that that, that was like super, super tiny. Um, just the level of detail in something so small is, is quite fascinating. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Amazing. Um, yeah, yeah, so just to go back to this clay pot, I, I love this kind of, yeah, it's so beautiful. Yeah, so this this image is really pretty significant. And uh, this is in Megiddo, which is uh, in Israel. And this aspect of a instrumentalist uh, playing and you sort of see some animals around. Um, kind of marks for us something really significant that's also found in the Bible is how different key individuals, David, even Moses, are really uh, shepherds. And you could mm. sort of imagine this is someone playing an instrument um, among some animals, and maybe it's to signal the animals or just to be a contemplative uh, moment of calm. But what's interesting about that figure is that it's not a symmetrical position of the instrument. You can see the instrument that he's holding that's right uh, in the middle. Um, ha it's larger on the left and shorter on the right. So it's tilted and more, you know, trapezoidal in, um, in design. And uh, that, um, that's consistent with uh, other images that we find of this era. That's amazing. And I know in a little, in a second or two, we're going to see a modern day reconstruction of, of that image. Um, but if we could just yeah, jump to the next slide where there's a beautiful mosaic of David, I'd love you to chat us through what we're seeing here. Sure. So this is a mosaic floor from a synagogue that's uh, in Gaza uh, from the 5th century. And here you can see David playing uh, with some sort of uh, um, uh, mallet or something in his hand that presumably would play the different strings. And what's different about this is the many strings that we find on the lyre here. So it, what, what's uh, interesting historically about this particular image is that as they were slowly able to uncover it and determine what it was, they weren't sure initially if it was depicting a person, and then they found the name David connected to it. And then wow. the face that we see seemed to have been reworked on um, over time. So maybe there were different images that people gave to what uh, David's face might be. So that's why it may look a little different, uh, maybe uh, a little brighter because it's probably newer than the other parts of the mosaic floor. At least that's what this is what archaeologists are saying. But from our standpoint, as a um, uh, uh, trying to understand the music of David, you can see that his left hand is behind the lyre and his right hand mm. has mallet. So it could be that he's making different kinds of sounds. You know, the plucking of the strings might happen with one hand, and then this um, mallet, which wouldn't be like like a hard hit, but the, the way that the mallet mm -hmm. would work would be a different type of sound that's really uh, hitting the string. That's fascinating. And I love what you're saying, because you can actually see his fingers are in that kind of shape. You know what I mean? His hand is not just there. It's, it's doing something to the strings, you know, at the back. So... Really, really yeah. interesting. Fascinating. And I think the other yeah. thing to mention about it is that you could see, you know, off to our right, that there's some animal, maybe a lion or mm. 
uh, some other leopard or some other uh, um, animal. And this aspect of animals involved in this imagery, you know, is, is really a very interesting notion. It is. No, it's really interesting. Um, and I know we just touched on that the image on the clay, on the clay pot. Um, and the next image we're going to show is just the modern day reconstruction of that image, which is beautiful. Yeah, this is, it is quite beautiful. And it's uh, pretty much a reconstruction of the instrument that we saw uh, from that clay pot. And as I said, there are other uh, examples of it. And this is done in uh, Haifa in Israel. Haifa University has a wonderful biblical instrument uh, collection. And um, you can see the four strings there. And we don't really know um, how those four strings would be tuned. But uh, different um, scholars and musicians have really played with um, how the music might sound. Amazing. I love it. What kind of wood do you think they would have used, th they used on that? That's a great question. I, I not being a, a, a biblical archaeologist or an archaeologist of this era, I don't know with certainty, but I know a lot of the texts talk about Akkadian wood. And Akkadian mm. wood might be, um, uh, and I'm not exactly sure what Akkadian wood is, but presumably their use of the term is because of its durability. Yeah, amazing. So great. Um, and then the next slide is some symbols. So I'd love to know what would symbols have been used for musically during the rule of King David? So we know that symbols were used as a signaling instrument. And the uh, most descriptive aspect of uh, music of King David's time um, in, a, in a larger celebratory context would be when David was uh, moving the ark um, as the uh, temple was, was being built. And there are comments of a symbol being used. And the symbol would be used more as a signal, we think, for another section of music. Oh, wow. Amazing. Um, and I love this next slide. Um, it's Second Samuel 6, verse 5. Um, and can you just discuss the scripture and, yeah, and, and with reference to the, yeah, to sure. the instruments? So, um, yeah, so it um, uh, is, is a translation that I'll, I'll try and, you know, annotate here or, or, or make some interpretations to. And David in the house of Israel played before the Lord with all manner of instruments made of cypress wood, um, with harps, so this is be reference to the Nivelle, with psalteries, mm -hmm. which the translation I took this from would be the Kinor, and with timbrels, and timbrels or tupim would be the Hebrew, would refer to uh, drums, and it's in the plural, so it's certainly more than one drum, with sistra, and we don't exactly know what sistra are, we think it's some form of um, a, a stick which has bells on top that would be shaken, and it says, and uh, as well as cymbals. So this sense of there being string instruments, uh, drums, and cymbals being played really shows that on, on this occasion that's mentioning in the second book of Samuel, that this is a really significant celebratory event. I love that, it's like an orchestra. <laughs> you know, it's exactly. amazing. A exactly. real symphony. So great. And I, I just, I love all the detail the Bible goes into our music. It talks about, you know, the specific types of instruments used, what they were made of, you know, just such an emphasis yeah. on instruments. It's true, but there, I, I, me and others would hope there would be more detail. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> we kind of have like, like treads of information, just be nice if there would be more. Yes. Yeah, 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 that's so interesting. So, so yeah, my question was gonna be, why do you think there's so much information on instruments, but but you're saying you wish there was there was more information on well, instruments? Yeah, well, I think that the, yeah. Yeah, the amount of references, at least in, in the way that I've calculated things in terms of looking at, you know, the entirety of the Hebrew Bible, there are about 500 references to music. And- Wow. Uh, you know, many mostly in the book of Psalms, but at least in this aspect of, of the biblical narrative, 
of David in the second book of Samuel and the way it's also retold in, in the books of Chronicles. Um, I, I think that the references to music really show how significant it is, you know, that, mm. that music was really a part of, of, um, of biblical life. And, and as you said, mm. you know, this is the, the equivalent, you know, of an orchestra of this time period. Yeah, that's fascinating. I love it. Um, and yeah, here's another, here's another amazing slide, just talking about Israel playing before God with all their might, you know? Um, and again, talking about, you know, there were singing, there were harps, there were psalteries, there were timbrels, you know, even trumpets. Like, it's just fascinating. And Mark, what are we, what are we looking at? What is that image? Yeah, so this what is, is so made of? What are we it's, from? Yeah, so, so this is um, an interesting uh, uh, thing that I'm doing of collapsing certain aspects of history. But number one, this is from the first book of Chronicles. And this particular text is in some ways the retelling of the, the story of David that we, uh, 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 of, of David in the book of Samuel that we just heard. And it's mm -hmm. mentioning many of the same things. But what you'll notice, which is key and different here, is that in addition to the harps and, and, and lyres and the timbrels and cymbals, it also mentions trumpets. So the aspect mm -hmm. of trumpets is the, the significant, uh, significant addition here. So the way I'm collapsing time is this is an image. Uh, it's an Egyptian um, image in what's a, like a boss relief where it's something that's like, you know, etched and carved into stone. And oh, wow. what you see here in many, in, in many similar uh, Egyptian images is many different lyre players. So we know that mm -hmm. this is a... Um, is some type of um, uh, representation of just the numbers of, of instrumentalists. Amazing, cool, so beautiful. Um, and and now we've got a couple of questions um, from from other people that we've collected. Um, if you're happy to answer a few questions, I know they're going to pop up on screen, and I will yeah I'll read them off to you. First one is, what advice would you give someone who would like to study music? Well, I think if one wants to study music, uh, you know, I don't know if the, the person would also want to play music, but the advice I'd give to someone who wants to study music is to really be passionate about it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, as a study of music goes, it's something that really has to be you know, a quest, a passion. Uh, and I also think that someone who studies music needs to be really open to multiple ideas. Um, I think that for myself and my particular journey of coming as someone who's trained in Western music and started by studying uh, the history of Western music, it's like my eyes being reopened and really refreshed by finding new perspectives through ethnomusicology. Um, and that was 40 years ago when I was studying. I think that the world in academia, at least in America, may be different now where there's more of a sense of this, um, you know, interplay between uh, different cultures. And uh, I think that the most important thing is someone come at the study with a very open mind. Amazing. Yeah, that's awesome advice. Yeah. And then we've got another one. Why do you think people connect emotionally with music? That's an awesome question. That sure is an awesome question. A really good question. Um, I think the beauty of music is that it, um, I think the aural experience of, of you know, exciting our, uh, our ears is um, a rather unique experience in the history of music, which we really take for granted because we could be surrounded by music almost 24 seven with the way that, you know, our life works today with earbuds and different things. But historically, that wasn't the case. You know, people would only hear music live and that would only be on very uh, rare occasions. Uh, and I think that uh, music somehow penetrates for a different experience because it's not only something that you hear, but often something that's felt. And that often happens, you know, through the ways that vibrations of sound work. And some of, some of the most incredible experiences, if you walk into a church or a building that really has an organ, and you hear when an organ plays, it has this just incredible power that uh, connects mm -hmm. to you. Um, I, I think another indication about 
emotional aspect of music is the question that you asked me about Saul and King David. I mean, Saul the king um, is told by his courtiers to have a musician because Saul isn't feeling good. And the way that it tells us that you go from not feeling good to feeling good is with music. So there is this recognition of how powerful music is, not only just to feel emotions, but to potentially mm -hmm. change your emotions. And that's something that's brought into the Jewish tradition in many other texts, not only in biblical texts, but also in rabbinic texts uh, going on much past the era of David, but as a formative aspect in the Jewish tradition is how music is so closely associated with prophecy. Because a prophet yeah. needs to be in the right frame of mind. And there are passages about the prophet Elisha that really says, when they ask Elisha for advice in the midst of a battle, Elisha says, bring me a musician. And says a wow. musician played, and Elisha then was able to be in the right mindset. So there's <laughs> this incredible aspect where from biblical times, um, even as we see in our timeline, even before what we have recorded in the Hebrew Bible, of the of musical instruments to be used. And I think that this is just an eternal thing of how music is so mm. connected to us emotionally. I love that. That really is awesome. And I, I love what you're saying about with Saul. His advisors were like, it'll make you feel better if you get a musician, you know? Um, it's just incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it great? I mean, wouldn't that be great now to go to a doctor and the doctor to tell you, you know, yeah. you don't need a, just, just listen to some music. Just listen to some music. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love that. Okay. We've got another question. Um, what modern day instrument do you think David would play? Yeah. Then, <laughs> um, I think he'd play electric guitar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, there's this wonderful, um, uh, uh, um, we didn't have in the presentation that, that we just showed, but some of the other fascinating figurines are um, figures of men and women both playing musical instruments. And there's one from the, the Tel Don um, um, excavation where it shows David almost like holding a box and holding his hand out. And it almost looks like David's <laughs> electric guitar so that's my inspiration for saying i think david would play electric guitar <laughs> i love it <laughs> that's so great um and um, what themes do you want to include in the music for david in musical themes you mean mm. yeah. um i mean i think that um what's an important representation of david is you know, during his perhaps his periods of solitude or his playing for Saul, that it's really just one instrument. And that aspect mm. of the richness of just the sound of one instrument, um, I think is is really important. And a lot mm. of it comes through a certain aspect of, of potentially repetitive notes, um, but also something that, that really has this great sense of, of, of something contemplative. And I think it really needs to range um, in David's era to, as we said, what this, you know, orchestra would look like. And, you know, yeah. being the nevel, the kinor, the harp and the lyre, as, as well as, um, uh, as we saw, the trumpets and drums. Uh, and what's, what's interesting out of this is that we really don't see uh, in those phrases that we just looked at, the aspect of a wind instrument. Um, so yes. it'd be really interesting uh, just to know how that might be incorporated. Mm, that's fascinating. And I've got a, just a, a question that I'd love to ask you, um, is what do you personally take away from the story of David? Yeah. Um, well, first off, I'll, I'll say within the Jewish tradition, David is referred to as Naim Zmirot Yisrael, the sweet singer of Israel. And mm, if you look at the story uh, of David, I would put it into context that within the Jewish tradition, we look at Moses as really being the first rabbi. I think what the Jewish tradition would tell us about David is he really becomes to be the real, the first musician. And it's someone who's mm -hmm. a musician that is, is connect, even though David had all a, a very 
a, a lot of challenges and troubles in his life. But music becomes uh, key, key and importantly, how he's really identified, you know, initially into mm -hmm. the biblical story. Um, but also um, that, you know, David historically is that individual that not only introduces music, but we really know more about music in the Bible connected to David than we can to any really any, any other individual. So he stands out as being something really significant. And I think that, you know, historically, it's not just a matter of being mentioned or what's, um, what's done historically, but this, you know, this Im imagery that is always made of David playing his lyre is mm. what many artists have done for centuries, many centuries, as we see with that mm. mosaic floor, um, in their their picture of what David was. So I think it we could see it as a, a very, very interesting model to think about the past. I love that. That's amazing. Well, Professor Kliegman, it has been such a joy speaking to you this evening. I say this evening, South Africa, but I know it's almost midday, maybe where you are. Um, but thank you so much for making time and for sharing all your wisdom and knowledge with us. And um, thanks for your support of the project. And to everybody watching, thank you so much. Um, we look forward to seeing you guys on future live streams. And please, if you'd like to support the project, head on over to angel.com forward slash David to express the interest. And um, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you so much. Look into my eyes. Do you see fear? You come at me with sword and spear, but I come in the name of the God of Israel. <laughs> between the eyes did you see that anyone uh, of course not okay then one more time <laughs> tally tally no <laughs> no i'm trying to protect us from this philistine oh <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. no not that way <laughs> come on Back to your mom. Right, Philistine. Oh, wait. Right between the eyes. Oh, of course. That one you saw. Tally! Tally, no! Coming, girl! Whoa, whoa, it, easy! Shira, Shira! I will bring her home safely.
Oh, that doesn't help. <laughs> that does. Stop. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> 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 